and um, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's been a while since we've had a Beyond Trees Network webinar. So for those of you who are new to this, my name is Liza Pakeo with the U.S. Forest Service International Programs and also one of the coordinators of the Beyond Trees Network, which is a large global network of urban practitioners from academics all the way to uh, researchers, to on the ground practitioners, to educators, to youth, and a wide variety of partners of all abilities. And so today we have the pleasure of having Fabiano Silva with the Fundação Victoria Amazonica. Um, he is based in Manaus, Brazil. And he's also one of the participants in this year's 2023 Urban Ecology Community for Learning and Practice that International Programs uh, organizes. So before we start, just a couple of housekeeping items. We do ask that you do mute yourself. Feel free to keep your video on if you want. If not, you can turn it off. But do ask questions and tell us who you are in the chat. Let us know where you're coming in from. This session is being recorded and will be available on YouTube um, in a couple of days. And then just as a preview for the next webinar, it will be on November 29th at the same time, and it will be on iTree Cool Air. It is one of the tools under the research suite of iTree um, related to iTree Hydro that basically looks at the relationship between land use and heat surface heat temperatures. So um, do join us for that because I think the applications of iTree Cool Air, if it's globalized and turned into an app, could have a lot of wonderful um, research and applicability on the ground, including addressing things like environmental justice. But today we're going to look at conservation in the Amazon. And Manaus, where um, Fabiano lives, is the largest city in the heart of this uh, large amount of land, of forested land. And so what does that mean in terms of how a growing city like that can affect all the uh, conservation efforts around it? But also what does it mean if there are no conservation efforts, what does it mean in terms of the communities that m could migrate into a city like Manaus? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce again, Fabiano, and I will have him share his screen or his PowerPoint. It will be about a 45 minute presentation followed by discussion. And so Fabiano, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, good to see everyone uh, in the call. Some people I know, some people I don't know. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we have a very good partner of ours, Kirsten Silvius, that is joining the call too. She works a lot with us in the past uh, many years, actually, of our work. So if you let me, I'm just sharing my screen real quick. Please let me know if you can see it. Is it on? Yeah, it's on? Yes, we see it. Thank you. Um, so my name is Fabio. Okay. He is frozen. Let's see. Fabiano, you froze. Yeah. Let me just text him really quickly. He might have to turn off his Can you hear me? Yes, and Fabiano, you may have to turn off your screen. Uh, I think you have you're having a bandwidth issue. Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, well, I'm actually in Nova Iron, which is not the capital, and here internet is definitely not good enough sometimes for this kind of calls. So please let me know if I freeze or if anything goes, uh, and I'll ask Lisa to share my presentation. Uh, and we'll work remotely. Is that okay? That sounds great. All right. So my name is Fabiano Silva. I live in Manaus in the region since 2005. Um, I actually uh, graduated from business 
And for the first five years of my work with FVA, uh, I helped establish an economic alternatives program in the organization. And then I left for my master's in the US and I came back in 2013 um, when then I held uh, the, the, the position of executive coordinator of the NGO uh, where I'm still until today. And this presentation is a general presentation about FVA's work. I tried uh, to emphasize a little bit of our work uh, related to city developments, urban planning uh, in the Amazon, but it's basically to give you a general uh, perspective of the type of work we do. And if anyone has any doubt, would like to go deeper in any specific subject, please feel free to write me or ask questions at the end of the presentation. And I'll try to talk less than 40 minutes. I'll try to stick uh, with 30 minutes presentation so we can uh, have a debate afterwards. Um, so FVA, Fundação Vitória Amazonica, was the first environmental NGO uh, of the state of Amazonas in Brazil. We were created in 1990. Um, and we were um, established uh, to be an organization looking at social environmental innovation that combines traditional and scientific knowledge for the promotion of effective alternatives for the development of the Amazon. But in fact, we work mostly in the Rio Negro Basin, which I'm going to go deeper in just a second. Um, so Rio Negro is the largest black uh, water river basin in the world. It comprises 81% uh, of, the, of the basin is located in Brazil, 11% in Colombia, 8% in Venezuela, and 1.7% in the Guianas. So much of Rio Negro is actually in Manaus, in, in the Amazonas state, actually. Uh, it's the largest tributary of the left bank of the Amazonas uh, River. Uh, it has over 700 rivers, 8,000 streams of water. So even though we talk about a, uh, a large forest, uh, Amazon rainforest, uh, we're, actually, we're actually talking a lot of uh, river bodies and aquatic uh, environments within that forest. So uh, as you will see in further slides, um, all hydrology and all the influence of these rivers are critical and important for the environmental conservation and for urban planning as well. Two of the largest freshwater archipelagos, Mariwa and Navillanas, are located in Rio Negro. I, I mean, the largest freshwater archipelagos in the world uh, with thousands of islands. The highest Brazilian peak is also in the basin. And the largest population of the Amazon is actually in Manaus with 2.2 million people. And the whole basin comprises about 2.7 million people. And there is over four. 40 indigenous uh, uh, groups that lives in Rio Negro Basin as well. So on the right, you can see the archipelagos of Anavilianas. It's a huge complex of uh, uh, flooded forests that in some part of the year it is flooded, some part of the, the year it is dried. Uh, we have cities uh, as the one that I'm talking to you from on the top left corner, which is Nova Irão right by the uh, Anavilianas National Park. And of course, we have a huge amount of forest uh, surrounding all the cities in the region. Um, and the Blackwater is a, uh, it's an associated ecosystem with great biodiversity, great social diversity, indigenous and non-indigenous. It has a very complex historical uh, occupation since uh, the 1500s. Um, it's an area heavily dependent on extractive resources um, and commercial value chains for limes, uh, uh, vines, uh, fish, uh, nuts, oils, um, several different types of non-timber forest products. And during especially the 80s and the 90s, uh, process of creation of protected areas, which in Brazil we call... Uh, uh, conservation units 
uh, and I can talk a little bit more uh, further. Um, so the most of the area, as I'm going to show you in the map following this slide, uh, is actually covered by some sort of protection, protection area. Um, however, during the 80s and the 90s especially, most of the people living in those areas were not consulted before the creation of those parks, which actually led to a lot of conflicts everywhere. Uh, this is a few pictures of the region. So this is actually Velho Airão, one of the first places the Portuguese established uh, when they arrived in the region. We have a very ancient and rich uh, indigenous culture in the region. So we have several petroglyphs which are those drawings uh, in the, the upper pictures. We have hundreds of thousands of archaeological sites, archaeological sites all over. And of course, we have many of those groups still living in the region uh, nowadays. A lot of traditional and local uh, handicraft production based on the fibers of Rio Negro. And why is Rio Negro important to us? Um, so in this region, several conservation strategies uh, are, are put one on top of the other. So we have an ecological corridor uh, recognized by the Brazilian government. We have a biosphere reserve recognized by UNESCO. We have a Ramsar site uh, also recognized by UNESCO. We have a mosaic of protected areas in the lower Rio Negro portion of the basin, uh, also recognized by the, by the Brazilian government. And this orange little piece of land over there is actually the Manaus metropolitan area, which is very important because they kind of conflict uh, with all the other strategies of preservation and, and environmental conservation. And it's a uh, specific policy looking at the development and the integration of cities in this re region over the protection areas and all the other conservation strategies uh, that play a part here in Rio Negro. And this is the ultimate map of uh, protected areas and development uh, territories in the Rio Negro Basin. So the Rio Negro Basin here is marked with the black line. Every uh, light green color are indigenous lands legally recognized by the, by the Brazilian government. All the brown areas are protected areas. And then we have the dark green, which is actually the ecological, uh, the, 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 the central Amazon ecological corridor. And the dark brown is actually the biosphere reserve. The uh, lighter brown is actually the mosaic of protected areas. And the red line is the Manaus metropolitan area. So imagine for communities living in this region to have to play along with different sets of rules, legislations, and policies uh, concerning what they can do and what they cannot do in each and every single specific protected area of this. Um, so, and, and just going back real quick, the, uh, the whole basin is actually 67% protected somehow, either by indigenous lands or protected areas or conservation units. Um, and it's 58,000 square uh, hectares, actually, uh, million square uh, hectares uh, of, of uh, the basin. So it's a huge territory. And FVA, Fundação Vitória Amazonica, is organized in three main programs. Uh, the umbrella program, we call it, is called Geopolitics of Conservation. And this program actually aims at generating knowledge and information for the proper management of these different territories, being a protected area, uh, a conservation unit, or a municipality. Uh, we work to create sound information based on scientific and traditional knowledge to improve decision making in those uh, territories. So we actually do research in different scales. We can do research focused on very specific communities, as I'll show you in just a second, or it can, we can, we can uh, develop research for the whole uh, Manaus metropolitan area or the whole uh, uh, lower Rio Negro uh, mosaic of protected areas, for example. So 
just a few uh, uh, maps of the work, the type of work we do. On the right uh, top left corner, actually, we were looking at flood zones in one specific river of the region, which is called Hiunini. So you can see the spots in white of the communities in those rivers and how these floods actually impact production areas uh, of small farmers, for example. For you to have an idea for from where I am right now, which is Nova Iron, uh, to the mouth of the river, it actually takes 36 hours of travel by boat. And from the first community on the right to the last one uh, on the left of the image actually takes us another 36 hours of travel by boat. So just to reach that further community, it might take us four or five days traveling to start our work uh, with those communities. On the upper right side, we were actually looking at deforestation patterns, uh, patterns uh, for agricultural use uh, throughout time. So every single little shape of that um, dashed uh, shapes are production areas and deforestation areas for agricultural production since 2001 up to 2019. And then can inform us and inform communities actually uh, where they're putting their crops and what is the likelihood of those crops being flooded in an extreme uh, year like we had last year. Um, and that supports both the management of the protected area, but as also uh, where communities will place their crops and their production to avoid uh, losing their crops due to uh, a, an extreme flood, for example. On the left, uh, on the bottom left, we were actually looking at Manaus area. Uh, this was an, a neighborhood that caught on fire, and this neighborhood was actually built on top of a riverside uh, area flooded, flooded flooded zone, so the housing was very poor condition, and due to a fire that broke out, most of this neighborhood was burned, and that led us to start studying what was the situation of the growth of the city towards those water bodies, and how we could propose promote uh, promote within the municipality a better piece of legislation to manage uh, what is called in Brazil permanent protection. Uh, areas, which are areas that either floods or they're ha or or uh, where they have uh, endangered species, or are areas of inclined um, uh, over forty degrees uh, scopes that people shouldn't be building on, uh, and that led us to make a huge study to the city, uh, counting every single building of this two million people city and which of the buildings were actually on illegal areas, each ones were okay, and how much the municipality should pay to indemnize and take out people that were living in risk zones of the city, for example. And on the right over there is a drone that we recently uh, acquired, uh, which is actually generating some very interesting uh, high resolution images uh, on those kinds of studies that we undertake. Uh, we also do, of course, a lot of biology research, uh, trying to understand what is going on in these areas, how people use those resources, and how how is the relationship between traditional communities and those non-timber forest pr products, for example, uh, to the improvement of their quality quality of quality of life and the maintenance of their livelihoods. And they we done tons of research throughout these thirty years of ex existence. Uh, on all sorts of things specifically. And important to state that one of our main works, especially during the 90s and the 2000s, was the development of uh, management plans for these protected areas. Uh, namely, one important management plan that FVA worked on was of the Jaú National Park, which until very recently was the largest Brazilian national park. Uh, with more than 2 million hectares uh, of area. So you can imagine how hard it is to come up with a management plan on uh, such a large area a day or two away by boat from the nearest city uh, in the Amazon. Just a few pictures to illustrate the biodiversity of the region. And our second program uh, is focused on human beings, on human development. So understanding the complexity of 
the the conservation approach and the development approach of the region we think that we believe that people need specific skills uh, to be active actors in this whole process and being aware and 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 taking informed decisions in the decision making processes of those territories so we work a lot with human development and trainings for kids, for teenagers, we provide uh, 60 plus courses on uh, technical issues and professional, uh, and, and, develop, and professional development uh, for both urban kids, urban adults, and people coming from communities, uh, which can actually do those courses uh, for free. And we also have projects looking, for example, the use of technology uh, in the public school systems. This specific project was undertaken in partnership with Manaus uh, uh, public school systems, where we trained professors, school managers to use different types of technology in the classroom with young kids. Um, again, the, the room we have here in Noveron, yes. Someone wants to ask something? All right. Yeah, just keep going. I, I'm um, getting all the questions together. All right. Uh, so we support actors from all over uh, in training processes. And we also have a strong focus on youth leadership development, uh, where we train them in several types of th themes and, and agendas uh, so they can actually understand what is going on in terms of protection, conservation, protected areas, and how those uh, uh, decision-making processes happen actually in the field so they can actually become a leader uh, in their own communities and play an important role in the management of these protected areas. And one of the tools we use a lot is to train those kids to use uh, information technology so they can actually produce their own content and disseminate their own agendas and their own issues on their own voices, in their own style, to their own communities, into the world. So we actually provide a central of media production here in Noveron, where they can use and produce videos, audios, newspapers, whatever they want to actually make themselves heard, themselves heard and, and improve their, their uh, communications with their community and with the world in general. Uh, so we work a lot of uh, with youth and focusing on training them to use uh, communication technology to make them be, be heard wherever they want to. And our last program, we focus on economic uh, alternatives, where we basically approach communities within Rio, Rio Negro, understand what are their expectations of development what are their potentials for business development, and we support them in community-based enterprise, uh, developing their work, basically. Uh, so we work with many types of products, from traditional fibers to the production of brooms, which is a value-added strategy to traditional fibers, Brazil nut. We're just now starting to work with uh, oils, uh, with, with, with natural oils, um, and handicrafts. So we have a wide vari variety of products and organizations we support for income generation and development and lo local regional economic development. So uh, this is a general perspective of the organization. And I think I'll let all the questions uh, for the end. So I'll just give you one brief example and one a little bit extended example of how these three main programs uh, work and articulate themselves. So specifically in the lower part of Rio Negro, we have this mosaic of protected areas. So each little color over there is one specific uh, conservation unit and every single one of them pretty much is a different type of protected area. In Brazil, we have almost we have over 20 different types of protected areas. Uh, so we have, for, for example, two main categories of protected areas. 
one being full protection, we call it, where you're not supposed to extract anything directly from nature. And we have a second category, which is called um, uh, sustainable use protected areas, where you can actually interfere, interfere and, 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 and actually extract resources from those protected areas. So specifically where is dashed over there in the northern part of the map is Rio Unini, Unini River, which is a very interesting river because it's protected by three different types of protected areas. The northern part, the, the, the little uh, purple area over there is called Extractive Reserve of Rio Unini, a uh, extractive or, or um, sustainable use protection area. The lighter, lighter green in the left, RDS Amana, is a sustainable development reserve Amana, which you can also extract resources from it. And the park, uh, and on the southern part, we have the Jaú National Park, which you're not supposed to directly use any specific resource. So imagine a community living in the frontier between two of those parks, they need to constantly deal with two sets of policies, one that allows him to collect fish, extract whatever resources they need for their for their traditional lives. And on the other margin, on the other bank of the, the river, they're not allowed even to live at uh, strictly by law. Uh, so it's a very complex river and it's a really complex situation to come up with economic alternatives. So understanding the policies and the the, the the livelihoods of people living over there, we can actually... Hello, would you mind um, muting yourself, please? All right. So within the Geopolitics of Conservation program, we undertook a 13-year-plus 30, 30, 13 project where we, we trained local monitors we uh, to do interviews with all the communities, with all the families that live in this river about pretty much anything they did in terms of fisheries, extractive alternatives, agriculture, use of uh, turtles, uh, Amazonian turtles, to know exactly where they were using, what resources they were using, what type of resources were important to them, and that would improve not only the management of the park, but that allowed communities to plan their own activities by themselves on a better informed uh, decision-making process. Um, based on that type of research, we knew that Brazil nut was a very important resource to them. So we started working with the Brazil nut producers to organize their own work. We mapped every single area of Brazil nut production we worked on conflict mediation because sometimes two different families were claiming the same Brazil nut area, for example. And after we trained and organized all the, the, the producers, we started building a factory and a community with their help, with their vision of how this community should be, be built uh, so they can actually control the whole process of production, of Brazil nut production from, from harvest to sales uh, in the middle of the forest. So everything was taken by boat, all the machinery. And nowadays they have a factory where they collect the nut, they control the factory, they add value to the nut, and they sell this Brazil nut with a high value added uh, to markets all over the region in Brazil. So this is one example, for example, on how research, people development, uh, human development and, and capacity building and economics alternative interplay to the development of certain communities, a certain river, uh, river or a certain region in Rio Negro. And a second example on a much larger scale to show you how these three main programs um, articulate themselves, um, talking specifically about the Manaus metropolitan area. This is a, north, a, part, uh, a map of the northern part of Brazil in gray. And the red dots, the red areas, are actually deforestation zones. And the Brazil metropolitan and the Manaus metropolitan area is actually in one of the most pristine areas 
uh, of the Brazilian Amazon. But we can still see a growing uh, trend of deforestation uh, in this region. And important to, to say from the start that the, the drivers leading to deforestation in what we call the southern and, and eastern part of the Amazon uh, are different than the patterns and the drivers leading to the deforestation in the Manaus metropolitan area. In the southern part is mostly due to logging, to cattle raising, and to the high markets of timber and cattle, basically, and soy later on. And the deforestation uh, in the uh, peripheries, uh, on the margins of cities in the center of the Amazon, are actually led by urban growth and the demand of wood for urban development, mostly. And of course, to some extent, to urban, uh, to rural production as well. So the Manaus metropolitan area has a very unique, also an important um, uh, set of drivers and specificities that caught our attention. Because if we didn't work with urban development, we would see our rural development work being compromised by the development of cities in the region. So looking at population growth in Manaus, it went through a huge explosion, especially after the 60s, 1960s, uh, because of the implementation of the Manaus Free Trade Zone, which was an industrial complex placed in Manaus by the military government to promote the urban development of, of, of Manaus and to place people in the heart of the Amazon uh, trying to avoid any sort of international occupation of this region. Um, however, this is the shape and the composition of the Manaus metropolitan area. It was created initially with these nine uh, municipalities that are orange uh, colored. And later on, a couple of years later, they aggregated these other five municipalities uh, tinted in gray. And all the little small red dots are actually what is of urban areas in this metro uh, metropolis, basically. And then we started looking at what was going on here in the metropolitan area. So the Manaus metropolitan area is actually the size of Iceland, of South Korea. However, while Iceland has 2.7% of water bodies or South Korea has 0.3% of water bodies, the Manaus metropolitan area has 10% of its area covered by water either rivers or one hydro dam uh, reservoir uh, on the northern part of Manaus metropolitan area. So it also houses 2.5 million people, most of the population of the Amazon. It comprises only 6.5% of the Amazonas state. And then we started looking what, of what is this metropolitan area. Only 0.4% of this area is actually urbanized. Of course, Manaus being the largest urban zone in the area. We have about 7.3% of rivers and 60% of the Manaus metropolitan area is actually covered by, by some type of protected area or indigenous land. So if we're thinking about the development or the management or policies for the Manaus metropolitan area, we definitely can't forget and can't oversee the importance of these protected areas. And we had a huge increase on forest fires in the past 10 to 15 years, uh, which is actually promoting a, a deep and significant uh, environmental degradation or forest weakening uh, in the region, led to a growth in rural development and rural production and the expansion of the cities located in the metropolitan area. And where does this deforestation come from? Comes from definitely it is led by urban expansion. And in this region, in the, in the in the basin of Rio Negro, we have two main cities, which is Manaus and um, Boa Vista in the Roraima state. So we can see the 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 the, the traditional pa uh, patterns of deforestation, which is called uh, which we called uh, fishbone. Uh, patterns of deforestation led by roads. Uh, so we can see closely to Manaus that a huge percent of the deforestation is actually very close uh, to urban areas. 
And of course, they are very close also to roads uh, in the region, which are very few, by the way. We have only one road leaving Manaus to Noveron, where I met. Uh, Manaus is on the right hand part of, the, of this, this image. Noveron is on the northern part, part of the map. Uh, and we have another road that connects Manaus to Boa Vista. And Manaus is not connected by road to any other part of Brazil. And there's a huge political debate right now to um, develop another road that is already opened uh, that would connect actually Manaus to the rest, to the southern part of Brazil, which has been gone uh, through a huge political debate right now. Uh, so we can see a little bit on where uh, the deforestation is based uh, in this right bank of Rio Negro, right across Manaus. And we also looked on how the deforestation is evolving throughout the years, both in Manaus on the right part, and both um, in the road that goes to Novairon on the left part of the, the slide. And we can, see, we can see there is a huge increase in deforestation and urban growth, especially in Manaus from 2010 to uh, from 1973 to 2010. And the same goes um, on this part of the river that I'm based at uh, in the last uh, same period, 73 to 2010. We can see a huge um, amount of deforestation, especially linked to the cities and to the road that connects Novairo. And this kind of trend and occupation led to this uh, context where we could see in 2015, the city of Manaus completely covered uh, by smoke, by forced fire smokes. And just this year, we had a worse situation that is taking over a month of the city completely covered by smoke, which led Manaus to be the third worst uh, city in the world in terms of air quality for several days uh, in a row. Um, and on top of that, we are just experiencing a huge impact of El Nino and other global climate um, uh, trends where we're just going through one of the largest droughts in the Amazon in the past 120 years. So these two satellite images of Anavidianas on a flood period and during this uh, dry season uh, and what's going on with the river. And I just chose two examples for you to show how much important and how much um, it's grown in importance, the adaptation and mitigation agendas in the region. So nowadays, this currently this week, uh, there are several communities lacking water and isolated uh, by the, the drought uh, because you can't reach them by boats anymore because they're just too far away with too narrow streams of water. Um, and since the water is very scarce, uh, the quality of the, of the water also uh, drops a lot and, and communities don't have water to drink. Um, and if nowadays we currently have in the Manaus metropolitan area 11% of the first station, and we did some scenarios building, and we estimate that in the next maybe 50 years, uh, we will get to a scenario, scenario of deforestation like this if nothing is done. Um, mostly due to the expansion of cities, roads, and the use of timber for the expansion of the cities. And as I mentioned, most of the deforestation is due to urban expansion, but we also have the unsustainable exploitation of several different types of resources being fish, for example, to support a 2.5 million, million people city region. Um, the use of sand and, and rocks for construction, the expansion of the city properly, namely in terms of deforestation for, for urban go growth, and also in inadequate use of urban technology and urban infrastructure uh, in the region. So, so we can see uh, the, uh, several neighborhoods with very inadequate um, housing uh, structure. Uh, in this region, for example, they built on top of a river uh, public housing. Um, and we see 
places where the sea we actually had some sort of canopy cover and they went through a development process where they channeled the river and they took out some part of the forest for urban development um, in other parts illegal occupation or or industrial development over uh, forests that were located within the city and a very poorly uh, thought of and planned urban development uh, set of infrastructures. And realizing the poor quality of the urban development planning in Manaus, we undertook a major study to provide to the city and strategy to better plan uh, urban development development in what we called, as I mentioned, um, uh, uh, permanent protection areas, which are mostly riverine uh, uh, places. So we can we could we, we, we could offer the city a better plan with better methodologies and better uh, strategies so the city could, keep their streams, keep their rivers, keeping their environmental services and the, their ecosystem services uh, along with urban uh, development and the promotion of quality of life within the city limits. So we did this huge study. I actually, I actually think I forgot um, to add a slide where we calculated what we called uh, the ecosystem integrity index for each stream in the city. So we could see which stream was actually still playing an um, important part in terms of ecosystem services. And we actually uh, calculated the opposite index, which is urban um, consolidation index, which showed which, in which stream was actually already urbanized and we couldn't recover. Uh, so we could recompose their, their ecosystem services. But that study, as we show here in this map, uh, mapped every single stream of the city, every legal and illegal occupation of the city, every single building of the city. And through that study, we actually helped the creation of this green uh, corridor, uh, which is support, uh, supposed to help preserve one of the most endangered um, monkey species in Brazil called Sawin de Coleira, which only exists within the city limits of Manaus. It is actually restricted by another monkey on the northern part of the city and in the southern part by Rio Negro and Rio Amazonas. So it's a very, very uh, specific and endemic uh, small monkey species that only exists in Manaus. And we're trying to come up with a corridor within the city limits that that, that uh, monkey can actually move around the city and, and meet and, and breed with other groups of their own species so they could be protected uh, within Manaus. It's actually the monkey, uh, the icon um, species of Manaus. And also, I forgot to bring a picture of it. And just two highlights that I would like to share to end my presentation. This is uh, the drone we've been using to generate high resolution images of the city, of the Amazon. Um, just for you to have an idea, the challenges we have to use that equipment. This is how it takes off. And for you to have an idea, it's really hard to use the drone because we don't have areas without forests that easily in the Amazon to fly the drone. This is one place we were able to fly this equipment in a, a rural community about three days away from Manaus. And of course, it's a show for the communities to see such a technology. Um, this is how it lands. Uh, and it's the first time actually uh, we're using and NGOs are using this kind of equipment uh, in the Amazon to generate these kind of images. So basically with that flight, we were able to spot a huge group of freshwater dolphins uh, in the middle of the river. And there is one lost dolphins. We don't know if it's a dolphin or a caiman uh, heading the group of dolphins. 
um, but this is a very rare and hard image uh, to get. Uh, and we use this kind of image both to support uh, the planning of communities, rural communities. We are hoping to fly the drone over uh, urban areas to help urban planning. And we can do a topography of the forest. And with that, we can start trying to identify specific types of trees that have some sort of value for the communities. And a second highlight that I would like to share to finish my presentation, we're just now developing a, a mobile app to support uh, the management of household income of traditional communities in the Amazon, which is initially focusing on fisheries, hunt, hunting, agriculture, extractivism, turtles, and hopefully very soon we will, we will add a component on tourism. And this process as everything we do was built uh, from the bottom up, we uh, aggregated, we, we called 13 uh, local partners of ours, people living in communities, fishermen, um, extractivists, uh, people working in agriculture, teenagers, older people, uh, to help us develop that uh, mobile app. Uh, so it had their way of understanding their reality, their way of speaking about natural resources uh, on an interface that was easy to them to use. And just this next uh, couple of weeks, we'll be launching the application, this app uh, for the general use of the public, uh, where we hope we support the intelligence of traditional activity in the Amazon and giving a tool where people can actually plan what they do and improve their household income um, so they can actually benefit uh, from the forest and actually decrease their, their negative impact on specific types of resources they are using. So to stick with my 30, 40 minute time, I think I actually spent a little bit more than I expected. Uh, I'll let you guys uh, think about a little bit of what I presented and I'm open to questions, uh, suggestions, recommendations and let me know if you guys would like to chat a little bit. Thank you so much, Fabiano. That was really interesting. And um, what a uh, really eye-opening intersection between protected areas, which we normally don't think of as within cities and the um, urban challenges uh, that you guys are facing in Manaus and surrounding areas. So I have a question from the chat. Um, and so for the, for everybody else, we do have a small group. So if you do want to turn on your videos, feel free and ask questions. But let me just get to this one question that was in the chat from Jonathan. How Can you speak on how the growth of Manaus and municipal development planning impacts indigenous land ownership and stewardship? Uh, okay, thank you for that question, Jonathan. Um, so the main thing is the surrounding areas of Manaus being a protected area or indigenous land, they actually provide a lot of food and resources for the maintenance of the city. So even if we don't have a growth of the city over those areas, which in some case cases they do happen, uh, there is a uh, stress on the capacity support of nature uh, to sustain a city as big as Manaus, for example. So we know, for example, that timber, sand, food, a lot of that is consumed in Manaus actually come from protected areas, traditional communities, or indigenous lands. I would say less from indigenous lands and more from protected areas. And in Brazil, we make a distinction between indigenous lands and conservation units, as we call it. Um, so we have one set of the government that actually looks at indigenous lands and one set of the government that actually looks for protected areas. Um, but ultimately what we're seeing is that both climate change and these extreme events are, are forcing people uh, to move from their areas closer to cities. Uh, and urban growth is stressing the demand for resources uh, 
uh, from rural areas to the city. Um, and if we don't come up with better cities, city architecture in the most, most broad term, um, we will keep on uh, uh, fomenting or, 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 provo or promoting a certain type of demand from the forest that are not good for conservation or even for livelihoods. So the idea here is how we come up with better cities, with better plant cities, so they can actually be a source of protection or stimulus for environmental protection in the Amazon and not the contrary. Not sure if I answered your question. Thank you, Fabiano, for that. Are there other questions um, in the group? I, I saw that uh, Kirsten actually uh, made a comment on one of the points I made. Um, this is important as well. Uh, and Kirsten knows a lot of our work because we've been working together for probably over a decade. Um, so in the Brazil net production, we started off uh, bringing everybody together in one specific river and asking them, where were their production areas? And that was the map I showed in my presentation where we put name tags to see if first where the production areas were and um, if there was any conflict between one specific area and more than one family. That started uh, organizing producers so they could better use the territory without with less conflict. And that's of course a very dynamic scenario. So every year people go away from the river, people come in, and this is a constant thing we need to deal with. Um, nowadays, that was in 2007, uh, this initial work. In 2012, we built a factory and the factory started producing. And up to today, there are dozens of projects looking at the Brazil nut production. Right now, actually, Kirsten is participating in one project where there's a group of researchers looking at the DNA composition of Brazil nut area productions comparing managed Brazil area productions and unmanaged or unused Bra uh, Brazil nut production areas or Brazil nut forests to see if the management actually increases biodiversity or leaving them alone are better for biodiversity. And they're researching DNA from water, from mosquito blood, from all sorts of indicators to see how this plays in terms and just now very recently there are some sorts of some technologies that are able to map brazil nut trees throughout the amazon on a much larger scale through gis and scenario building please correct me if i'm wrong kirsten no that's great i mean it's going to be amazing once the trees can be mapped it's such a huge commodity i mean it's an internationally traded commodity and yet there's so little actually known on the ground about the species so uh we're eagerly awaiting fea to get their drones out there and map things and work with all the gis people because because fea can help to ground truth efforts being done by remote sensing so it's it's going to be very very cool because they know the territory so well so good work so Fabiano, thank you so much. Um, the it, are you available or okay with people reaching out to you sure. via email? Wonderful. So with that, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today and for um, to Fabiano for a really scintillating exploration of where he lives and works. And um, we hope that you'll come back and and update us on what's going on in your region. So with that, thank you everybody. I appreciate this. And uh, this, if you came in and out or came late, this video uh, recording will be on our Beyond Trees Network YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.